What if you were an ambulance chasing lawyer desperate for relevance and cash until you are hired by aliens to represent them before the United Nations? These aliens want to heal every human disease in exchange for the low, low price of 30% of Earth's gold. This turns you into the target for not only big pharmaceutical companies, but the aliens themselves. This is the world of Maxine Justice, Galactic Attorney, a new book landing on Earthling shelves this week. And sci-fi writer Daniel Schwabauer joins us to explore these new kinds of ETs who do not attack militaries, but come after big business. Welcome back to Fantastical Truth, the small business podcast from lorehaven.com, where we explore fantastical stories for God's glory and apply their meanings to the real world Jesus calls us to serve. I'm E. Stephen Burnett. I publish lorehaven.com, and I also co-wrote the book, The Pop Culture Parent. And I'm Zachary Russell, and I am not a lawyer, so please do not come to me with your galactic legal questions. And this is episode 105. What if planet Earth were invaded by hostile corporate aliens? And that is the plot of the book, Maxine Justice, Galactic Attorney. And we'll be meeting today with that book's author, Daniel Schwabauer. Zach, while I was outlining this episode, somehow, and I won't get into details, but I was just surrounded by lawyer type stuff. There was a real life thing going on. There was this podcast going on. And I think I was uh, listening to a podcast that was talking about, of course, uh, a lot of lawyerly details as we're recording this uh, with the nomination of a new candidate to the United States Supreme Court. So suddenly in one day, it was just lawyers, lawyers everywhere. And of course, insert your favorite lawyers or scum joke here. I need to give a shout out, though, to lawyers because I, I filter this question, this profession through the eternal perspective I try to apply to everything. And I've actually asked myself, if you have the new heavens and new earth in mind, a concrete physical kingdom, Jesus Christ ruling in power, the master of all power on earth, will we still have attorneys? And I think the answer is yes, simply because humans have got to organize and to organize, you need policy and for policy, you need laws. And if you're going to have laws, you need to have lawyers to interpret those laws. Will we have lawsuits? I don't think so. Will you have personal injury lawyers? Of course not. He will wipe away every tear. There will be no mourning, nor pain. And so there's no reason to put up a billboard assuring someone that you can make their pain go away simply by suing the person uh, who made you slip and fall and experience that pain. Okay, I was going to try to make a joke, but actually this was a question I was talking to my pastor about recently, which is in the new earth, are there going to only be Christians or is there going to be a mix of Christians and non-Christians? And the reason why I Dude, ask only is, Christians, it's gotta be only Christians. So well, I'm, t I'm talking about the, the, will ever, oh, well, the I'm talking about the millennial kingdom. kingdom. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I skipped that part. Sorry, Darby Kern. I do. I skip it <laughs> <laughs> because it says, you know, he will rule them with an iron scepter. So who is, who is the day? Like who, who does Jesus need to rule with an iron scepter? Surely it's not his people that will be changed in, in a twinkling of an eye and have the new new body and, and no more sin. I think there's going to be people still on the earth that are, are not saved yet. Maybe some of them will, maybe some of them won't. But also at the end of the millennial kingdom, there is a group of people led astray by Satan when he's released. They're going to wage war on God's people. So again, who in the world is Satan going to deceive? And, and side note, that's kind of crazy that'll even happen. Like how, how could people who have seen Jesus on the earth be deceived by Satan. But that, that again, it goes to tell me that there will be unsaved people on the earth during the millennial kingdom. And so, yes, I think there will be a court system. There will be some kind of legal system. I mean, it says that we will judge even the angels. I, I assume the fallen angels. And so there will be some kind of court proceedings even then. So I, I think you're right. I, I think it's not going to be like what we see nowadays, but there will be something like that. I think the all millennialists would tell you that Jesus is ruling now. And so, of course, there are non-believers in his kingdom. Uh, I don't know what the post-millennialists would do. And I'm not a non-millennialist. I don't know what I am. This yeah, isn't even an end times podcast. Yeah. yeah. Well, Christians, How do we always no matter, get on this topic? <laughs> I don't know. But Christians, no matter your end times belief, we can all agree in Christ that God himself will be the judge and the prosecutor and the executioner bit of dark thoughts there, but hey, that's part of our testimony as Christians. We actually rest assured that God is the judge will judge fairly because 
our place in the witness stand is that being taken by Jesus Christ, who represents us. That is our testimony. And speaking of which, our first sponsor for this episode is Andrew Chamberlain's The Testimony Podcast. Here's the description. The Testimony Podcast features people of faith telling these stories that matter from their lives. These are testimonies of God's grace in times of great blessing, as well as moments of hardship and difficulty. Each episode features a conversation between host Andrew Chamberlain and a guest who reflects on the times in their lives when they have felt Jesus as their close companion. These can be hard conversations, but they tell of the mercy and grace of God. You will hear from men and women from a wide range of backgrounds, leaders in the church, artists, musicians, writers, and entrepreneurs, sharing their testimony of how Jesus has journeyed with them in their lives. You can listen and subscribe to the Testimony Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, and wherever you source your podcasts. See that link in the show notes or by going to lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors. True to his genre, I believe our guest is arriving via a science fiction vehicle. Let's open the recording studio doors and see how he arrived today. Daniel Schwabauer has just arrived in his Viper from Battlestar Galactica. He is an award-winning author, speaker, and teacher. He is the creator of the one-year adventure novel, cover story, byline creative writing curricula, and the author of the young adult novels in the Legends of Tira Noor series as well as Operation Grendel from Enclave Publishing and recently Maxine Justice Galactic Attorney from the same publisher. His professional work also includes stage plays, radio scripts, short stories, newspaper columns, comic books, and scripting for animated TV. And now the pinnacle of his career, his appearance on Fantastical Truth. Daniel, thanks for coming in today. I am delighted to have arrived finally at the pinnacle. Thank you. <laughs> You have made it. You have arrived. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we always ask first when someone enters the studio for the first time, how did you discover biblical faith and fantastic imagination? And then I just thought I would add this wild card question here, just in case you've ever heard of this particular niche series. What role, if any, did C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia play in your journey? Yeah, well, I actually have coincidentally heard of... Uh... C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia. We uh, never get not. that. Yeah. That's so weird. It's so <laughs> funny to see a like-minded sure. uh, fan of, of this really <laughs> un unknown series. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, my uh, journey to faith, really, I was raised Lutheran, but I didn't really, um, I would say, embrace it or own it for myself uh, until I was in college and I was diagnosed with spinal cancer. It was a misdiagnosis. Wow. I had actually uh, broken my back in five places, but I had watched my grandfather die of cancer, and I had watched my father have a series of strokes and heart attacks that uh, put him in the hospital and resulted in the doctors say he's, you know, he's not going to make it uh, you know, more than a few weeks. He lived 26 more years, but at the mm, time, wow. it, to me, it looked like you know, grandfather, dad, and now me. I was I'm diagnosed with spinal cancer. Mm. So I started uh, reading everything I could get my, could get my hands on uh, to try to figure out you know, is there a God? What happens when I die? Which could be very soon. And I ended up reading every, like the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita and uh, New Age writers and, and Lao Tzu and Confucius. And they all seemed like they had really good ideas. But then I discovered my other grandfather's Bible mm. uh, that had been left to my mom. He was a Lutheran uh, minister. And I started reading the words in red. And the words in red got to me. So, uh, one day in college is by myself, I'm reading the words in red and it, it dawned on me. Lao Tzu had some really good ideas, but they just seemed like good ideas. But when Jesus said stuff, it's like, this guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> if it's not him, it's nobody. Mm. It's, it's, he's either who he said he was or, and you know, I had not read C.S. Lewis at the time, but if he's not who he said he was, then there is no God. Yeah. There's nothing meaningful so well you've skipped to the end and went to the words of jesus in red and otherwise in the holy bible <laughs> all inspired yeah. by god uh without going through ashland first uh, again yeah that is so strange to hear from a fantastic <laughs> guest and in fact if i may dare to say that is probably the best way to become a christian is listening to jesus first but hey if it takes c.s lewis to uh, usher you into his presence then that's also great absolutely i mean i i'm I'm someone who thinks, you know, however God gets you there is great. Uh, be happy with, with whoever and whatever vehicle is, results in real faith and, and real um, discipleship of Jesus. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in college, there's not a lot of, I didn't have a lot of su 
report. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying, you know, looking around, I didn't know where to go next. I ended up reading uh, the Space Trilogy first. Oh, nice. And and that kind of made me go, well, didn't I read something about a magical lion when I was in grade school? Or oh, wow. <laughs> so you, you went, went to back. the Ransom Trilogy before Narnia. That's yeah. great. Yeah. That, and I loved the second time I read the Narnia books because I'd read them when I was in grade school and didn't get it. And after I read the Space Trilogy and I reread Narnia, I was like, oh my gosh, this guy is amazing. Uh, I, I could not believe how much was in there. And I was studying creative writing at the time. So it was very, um, it was very meaningful to me. And that, that led me to Chesterton and George MacDonald and other fantasy writers. Yeah. Well, and th- that's so cool that you went on this journey of reading. And I, and I imagine, you know, about that time in college, this was, you know, pre web MD. <laughs> so you, you didn't just get <laughs> yes. sucked down a black hole of, uh, self-diagnosing every, every kind of horrible disease you might have. And then Correct. you get all these, yeah. you get all these books from the, uh, the other religions and then you, know, you find a Bible and yeah. It probably helps that uh, Jesus also died, but came back to life, and so he can tell us, you know, what the other side is like, and uh, yep. and and hey, and more than that, more than just telling us about it, he can give us that eternal life. Yeah, when, when I was in college, there were still card catalogs, so <laughs> so it was way before all of that. And I, I should mention, I mean, it just like I don't want to leave out a piece, which is to me really important, and that is, I didn't just intellectually like decide I'm gonna you know, I'm going to do this thing. I mean, I did mm-hmm. say I'm going to f- yeah. follow you, but, but Jesus made himself real to me. And what made the difference for me was this sense of, oh, wow, he's real. <laughs> he's alive. He's not just this good idea that I can subscribe to and maybe he'll make my life better. It was, it was yeah. like, I, I encountered something and it's hard to describe, but the, he made himself real to me in a way that couldn't be faked that i knew wasn't my emotions and um i needed that because the next i was in college for eight years and the next few years were very challenging for me um in terms of what i was learning i was studying science fiction and the the worldview behind that is especially at the time it's not really extremely materialistic yeah Yeah, (laughs) yes well and, and i had the good fortune of of uh being you might say trained I, I i took every class uh taught by james gunn at the university of kansas oh neat it's fantastic teacher so not guardians of the galaxy james gunn this is another no, gun okay. this is uh a, correct he's he's a uh hugo and nebula award-winning i mean he, he passed away a few years ago at the age of i think 96 uh, i saw him just before he died and, and thanked him for his influence but he was he was very much a humanist who thought i was nuts <laughs> You know, but, but even though he thought, I mean, I don't, I can't say that he, for sure that he thought I was nuts, but the way he talked to me, he seemed to be like, you know, what is, this is a phase, you'll grow out of it kind of thing. Mm, um, yeah. But in spite of that, he didn't dismiss my interest in science fiction and storytelling. And so I'm grateful both to God and to him for what he invested in me in spite of really hating my worldview. And I did not like his worldview either, but yeah. <laughs> somehow, you know, that connection there was helpful to me, even though it was challenging. I find it fascinating that to some extent, fantasy as a genre is more directly related to Christian influence, not just because of Lewis, but Tolkien and Chesterton and others, and that tradition from which the genre comes, whereas science fiction seems to me to be uh, one more degree removed, because at least the impression that I've gotten is that science fiction, unlike fantasy, came from more of that humanist perspective. Like it, it comes a little later in development, starting in around the 20th century, at least the modern science fiction. Mm-hmm. But even uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, arguably the first modern science fiction novel, uh, was coming from a person who was like, experimenting with different lifestyles and then uh, thinking about yeah. what would happen if scientists could use electricity could bring, to bring people to life. I find that difference between the genres interesting, and I think it may help explain why you see a lot more traditional fantasy genre stories from Christian authors, uh, whereas science fiction stories like Maxi Justice are a little less common. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it was one of the things that I had to wrestle with in college because I love science fiction. But there was this worldview disconnect that is just, you can't miss it. And, and it's in part, I would say, because of the influence of John Campbell as an editor um, and, and the way he shaped the genre back in the, you know, 20, 30s, 40s, well, 30s and 40s more, but 
his shaping of the genre and saying, these are the things we're going to do. We're going to stick, you know, only to material, a material universe that's the same as the one we're in. And I'm going to go for writers who, who can actually do some characterization <laughs> and know how to tell stories. I mean, it's very influential. So I'm, I'm reading that when I'm in college, I'm reading all this golden age of science fiction stuff and going, why am I drawn to this when it's assumption is actually contradictory to my worldview. But having C.S. Lewis there going, but this guy's doing it, and he's doing it in a way that fits within the rules of science fiction. And it took me a while to, I don't know that I have the answer, but it took me a while to realize there is something in placing it in a universe that's uh, more closely like ours that gives it a kind of prophetic power. I don't mean spiritually prophetic. I just mean the ability to speak to situations and experiences that we have that can, it doesn't always, but it can make it very relevant. Yeah. I, I've heard it said, you know, we are, we are living in the science fiction world now. You know, mm -hmm. it, it is, it is not just the, the futurist genre. It's the present day genre because of so much, you know, advancement technologically that's happened the last 40 years, particularly the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I'm reading this book now. I'm, I'm by no means a C.S. Lewis scholar, but it's made me think about a lot of things. I'm reading his book um, on stories, the essay on science fiction. So it's really interesting to see what his perspective at the time was about kind of this, this really, um, I mean, this was in the, I guess the fifties. Um, yeah. Lewis was in, an early adopter when it yes. was called scientific fiction. Right. But, e but even then it was, it had been going on for, I guess, a couple of years, but it was really, you know, burgeoning then to see the authors that he liked or didn't like, or kind of the ideas he liked and didn't like from other popular authors. And, um, something I've zeroed in on lately was, I guess you could say his conflict with people from the Fabian society and, and how that, uh, th this is like a whole other rabbit trail. A bunch of his contemporaries were part of the Fabian society. They were Fabians. And that worldview has really seeped into a lot of things today. And it's, it seems like it's been the dominant strain of science fiction ever since then. And so looking back on that, it's like, oh, that makes so much sense. That, that the trends we see in science fiction really skew kind of orthogonal to Christianity at times. Whereas like Stephen said with fantasy, fantasy is often about just the, the struggle between good and evil, you know, defeating the dark Lord that's taking over the world. And it's, it's very easy to kind of map that onto Christianity. but the science fiction started out with the uh, with these very different views on humanity. At the same time, it's so much more relevant to the world we're living in. So I, I think it's an interesting contrast. But um, I I really want to dive into more of, of what Lewis thought about the books of his era and the authors and how that how he saw that shaping society. I'll bet you've probably studied a lot of that. Well, it's been a while since I put really put my um, energy into into that. I walked away from science fiction for a number of years. Mm. Um, one of my one of my thoughts about it in the ni late '90s, when I decided not to read or write science fiction for a while, was just that science fiction was trying to take the place of religion in a way. It was mm. trying oh, to absolutely. provide us a it's like a um, where we came from and where we're going. <laughs> so here, here's the history of mankind from our perspective, and then here's where we're going. And it really fits American uh, culture, where we're, where we don't like to pay a lot of attention to the past, and we yeah. and we, we're extremely optimistic about the future. Mm -hmm. uh, science fiction <laughs> really plays into that, right? Um, yeah. You know, the past doesn't matter that much, but you know, we'll we'll come up with some story about, and then we'll, okay, that's fine. That's all all we needed. Now we'll take it from here. <laughs> the future is going to be great. We're going to have technology and chemistry that's going to fix everything, and and then you know that doesn't work out. <laughs> Well, your version of the future in Maxine Justice Galactic Attorney is fairly similar to the present in that you have personal injury lawyers, defense lawyers, and a lot of uh, similar earth culture going on, except a few different types of personalities are robots. There are judges who are robots. Uh, there is even a pastor, uh, like a counselor type figure who is a robot. Uh, as we move then into chapter two, uh, dealing with your, your very latest release from Enclave Publishing, how did you meet Maxine Justice and aliens in this sci-fi world? So you mentioned you kind of put science fiction on hold for a while. Uh, you wrote uh, several other books uh, in the more fantasy genre, and then you wrote this, uh, this military book, uh, Operation Grendel, 
was your first release from Enclave. So what brought you then back to science fiction proper, uh, even if it's kind of a more, uh, more whimsical contemporary take on the, on the genre as we see in Maxine Justice? Well, Maxine Justice came out of a short story idea that I had 26 years ago um, that I, I wrote about 10 pages of and just realized I'm, I can't do anything with this story. It's not going where I want it to go. And it was the idea of, uh, of Earth being taken over in a hostile kind of corporate takeover rather than, you know, they, they're always using weapons and bombs and, and robot warriors. And, and it just mm-hmm. seems like a very expensive way to take over a planet. You know? <laughs> uh, why, maybe there's a cheaper way for the aliens to do it. And nice. then I started thinking about humanity and, and, you know, what would it take for us to sell out our own future? And I mm. thought, well, probably not very much. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's sad, but but uh, I'm a little cynical about human nature. And I think we, we could probably, under the right circumstances, be talked into making a deal that would sound really good, but wouldn't turn out to be very good. And, and uh, so I started turning over this idea again a few years ago. And I was talking to my daughter. She's, uh, she's very bright. She's a writer, um, has an English degree. And I was telling her about this story that I hadn't touched in so long. And she, um, as, as is really helpful with, with wonderful idea people, she told me the thing, the key that unlocked the story. I had been making it with a male main character, a male protagonist. I and wondered said, if the story had started that way. Yeah. That's fascinating. Hmm. Yeah. She said, w- wouldn't this make more sense if it was from a, a woman's point of view? And, and as soon as she said that, I went, okay, am I even capable of writing this from a woman's point of view in a way that's believable? Am I capable of doing that? But also, yes, <laughs> the story would make much more sense and it'd be a lot more interesting and as soon as she said that, and I started thinking about it, within, I don't know, a couple of days, I had all these details about who Maxine Justice was, and her name, even, Maxine Justice, uh, uh-huh. that she had changed from something else in order to get clients. And, and, <laughs> and, the, and the idea that there's this, there's this hero who is the hero we absolutely do deserve, <laughs> but it's not, not the hero the we need. need. <laughs> She's <laughs> not the go. one we need. <laughs> yeah. But who re- better to be an icon of humanity than a personal injury lawyer who is desperate for relevance and cash, right? Uh, like that's humanity in a nutshell. So maybe she could be <laughs> our defense attorney. And uh, that just delighted me. So the rest of the book, I won't say it was easy, but uh, it's, it's a book that I wrote with a constant sense of playfulness that doesn't always happen when I'm writing. And it just, I felt like I'd been introduced to somebody real which may sound weird if you're, if you're not a writer out there, <laughs> Some, sometimes characters just come in and there they are and they kind of start taking over things. And that's what Maxine did. A little principle that I've made up, and I don't even remember whether I heard about this from a writing pro, but generally I've found that if the author and or the publisher is brave enough to put the main character's name into the title of the story, or secondly, the series name of the story, then they believe that character has a potential to be iconic. You know, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, something yeah. like that. It tends to have the effect where there's, there's kind of a naturally limiting effect where if you, if you don't believe in the main character, then the title of your novel is going to get a little more abstract. But you've got her right on the front, and uh, there she is uh, looking uh, bold and ready to represent humanity. But you open the pages and you find as you mentioned, a very different type of character. Like you start, because I'm, I'm reading it now, I'm about 10 chapters in, and she's eminently supportable. Uh, you get where she's coming from. You understand that this is just the way the legal system works. Uh, she has been just recently fired uh, from this big firm where it's kind of strongly hinted, at least in the beginning, uh, that she was being harassed there. So this is not a feminist story, but you know, this is a woman in what is traditionally viewed as a man's world. And so there's that latent conflict there before you even get to the aliens. Uh, my pitch, by the way, for this book is that it is Galaxy Quest meets John Grisham. But Daniel, you had a different sort of pitch. Uh, you mentioned John Grisham, but what was it that you, uh, you pitched the book as? I pitched it as uh, if John Grisham outlined a novel and gave it to Terry Pratchett to write a rough draft. <laughs> uh, but if, if Terry Pratchett was also uh, had, had uh, C.S. Lewis standing over one shoulder making snarky comments after he'd had one too many <laughs> sherries, that would be what came out of, out of my weird imagination. 
Now, I'm not uh, an attorney. I have at least one attorney in my uh, my family. But how much legal research did you need to do uh, in order to adapt the present day legal system to this uh, futuristic society? I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that question. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to? Uh, you cannot answer without the presence of legal counsel. Yeah, yeah. No, no. It's I worked a lot of as Perry an, Mason reruns. <laughs> Uh, no, not actually. I, I worked for an insurance company as an adjuster, a multi-line adjuster for years. And ah, I worked with attorneys. So ah. we actually did a lot of contract stuff. Uh, that doesn't make me an attorney. And, and one of the reasons that I decided to set this in a kind of corporatized, uh, dystopian near earth, near future was I wanted to be able to do things with the legal system, not only to comment on it, but also to kind of give myself some breathing room. If if I had things be a little different, well, when the um, judge is a robot, yeah. things are a little different. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> uh, at least uh, I wonder how the Supreme Court nomination process works uh, when the the pool of talent uh, being oh, cultivated be through the appellate structure is <laughs> is actually a synthetic life form and uh, doesn't have uh, Earth emotions or human emotions. Daniel, I really enjoy this story, by the way, and not just because generally when Christian authors are trying to write legal thrillers, it's about an issue. Uh, it's about prayer in schools or the Pledge of Allegiance or, you know, God, yeah. America and apple pies. And it's rather refreshing uh, to have just kind of a more basic legal approach, uh, at least until the aliens get there, which brings us to the aliens topic. Got to mm -hmm. ask you about them aliens. Let's see them aliens. Whenever Christians are writing about aliens, typically, Zach, you and I both know and love this explanation, uh, the Christian explanation for aliens. It's easy. They're demons. The aliens, aliens are demons, and it's, and it's Satan. Which, it's like which that kind of, meme. Uh, I'm not saying it's, uh, it's demons, demons, but, but it's, it's demons. definitely <laughs> demons. Yeah. yeah, or it's Nephilim. Yeah, it's, it's either <laughs> demons or Nephilim, or possibly both at the same time. We love us some Nephilim, at least in yes. the Christian fantasy author world. Which kind of holds back science fiction as a genre because not all science fiction has aliens. But if your story has aliens, it's probably science fiction. And if Christians are saying there's only one alien explanation, well, there's only so much room for stories to grow. Uh, right. Not necessarily asking for spoilers for Maxine Justice because I don't know yet where these aliens come from. Like I'm not far enough to know, so I'm I'm safe yeah. from spoiling it for the rest of our listenership. But just in in your view, like how did you approach the topic of aliens? from a, a Christian vantage? Well, first I would say, um, the, my approach to story, like, uh, in terms of issues is if social issues come and go. And to me, the path to propaganda and irrelevance is saying, I'm going to hit readers over the head with an issue. Um, mm. that's essentially saying, um, you know, that I, I want to force you to understand the relevance of the story rather than allowing you to see whether it's relevant or not. I mean, and it just really, to me, it doesn't work. I think human nature doesn't change. And so if we, if we write in a way that, uh, that tells the truth about human nature and the truth about our systems, our, our medical system, like in, in Maxine Justice, the medical system, the legal system, how does it work? If you just tell the truth about it, people will see things in it that will make sense to them and feel relevant to them. Mm -hmm. When it comes to aliens, I'm agnostic on what aliens are or could be. Thank you. Yes, me <laughs> I too. Don't, I don't know. <laughs> yes. But in, in writing a science fiction story to just say that they're demons, okay, then that in, in science fiction, I've got to explain then what demons are. Is this mm. a rip in some kind of inter, you know, dimensional portal or something? People already know what aliens are. If I just treat them as another species, the reader will fill in whatever they need to fill in. Uh, maybe a more complex way of saying it is the closest I would get to comparing aliens to demons is aliens might have some demonic tendencies. They might do things that you could look at the scriptures and say, what are the characteristics of demons? If aliens follow those characteristics, readers will connect them without me having to. And I don't really have an interest in introducing, um, at least at, in this story that I was telling, the Introducing the complexity of a cosmology that involves not just aliens, not just alien courts and alien law and all that, but also <laughs> there's some other interdimensional aspect to it as well. It, it just seemed way too much for a, a novel of this length. 
Well, then you're getting into too many kinds of magic, right? So you, yes. you have to watch out for that trap, which was yes. the uh, yep. which was the classic criticism of the M Night Shyamalan film Signs, where you had both aliens and God intruding into the story, and uh, yeah, anyway, lit yeah. off a firestorm of criticism. But I like how you said that the you know the path to irrelevance is to hit people over the head. So I'm a fan of the Critical Drinker uh, YouTube channel. Don't, don't ask me why. It's just be, it's become kind of my guilty pleasure <laughs> okay, lately, yeah, yeah. where he reviews uh, movies and books and all this kind of stuff. And you know, he he has this phrase, "the message." You know uh-huh. how everything now has to yeah. be about the message. Yeah. It gets so tiring, and you're right; it just gets so old, like so fast. And in a couple of years from now, no one's going to care about what whatever the message was of right. 2022. At the same time, I, I am curious to know how, you know, like you said, going back to the 90s, you walked away from sci-fi because you didn't like how that was becoming this replacement religion. So I, I'm curious to know how you are kind of subverting that tendency of sci-fi or sort of the, not, not just like the tropes, but like, I mean, the messages of sci-fi or the, the worldviews of sci-fi. How are you going about trying to create something different with your work? Oh, that's a really interesting question. And I, I don't know that I, hopefully I'm not pretentious enough to think that I'm <laughs> doing something important with my work. I do have, a, I have an opinion about this that may be unpopular with people kind of on both ends of the spectrum. And my, my opinion about storytelling is that our, our culture is inundated with, in some ways, really great stories. We, we're living in, like streaming has made long form storytelling a very complex nature. Uh, possible in a way that wasn't possible, you know, 20 years ago. At the same time, with the uh, development of a Marvel Universe CGI stuff, uh, I would say, t- in a nutshell, what we're getting is a competition between two types of storytelling. And the first type is a, it basically says that power is the key to storytelling, and you have a hero who is the embodiment of principled power, and you have a villain who's the embodiment of unprincipled power. This is what Marvel movies do all the time. Mm. And, they ju- and we love watching them bash it out, and, and regardless of the collateral damage to, to cities and stuff. We love our Iron Man and Spider-Man and all, all that. As a storytelling type, as entertaining as it is, it ends up being fairly empty. And the really great classic stories that have last strip power from the hero, and they pit principle, naked principle, against raw power. And that's an mm. oversimplification of it. But in, in th- that theory, the reason that is helpful is that it allows us to see the relevance of a story for our lives. Because I don't have the power in every situation, but what I can have is the principle. So the consequence of not just science fiction, but primarily science fiction and fantasy, saying it's principled power versus unprincipled power, is it draws us into this contextual universe of the story. We love meaning, which is one thing pointing to another. And in a story, everything is meaningful. So we we binge something on Netflix, and then the next day we go to our cubicle at work, and the stapler is not meaningful. My irritating boss is not meaningful, (laughs) at least not in a way that impacts my life. Nothing seems as meaningful as it is in the story. And so there's this addiction to storytelling, but it's storytelling that is not ever it's not ever crossing that contextual overlap between like the context of the story and the context of my life is what creates relevance. When those two things don't overlap, all I get is this desire for more and more story from the, uh, something to satisfy my need for meaning. Yeah. And so uh, this is a, a long, uh, explanation. No, that that I, makes I, sense though. Story as snacks versus stories as a, as a meal that leaves you satisfied. Yes. And lots of people. So I'm, I'm an apologist, as, as many of my friends know, for director Zack Snyder's films in the DC what? universe. What's that? I know, right? It's just like uh, C.S. Lewis informing a Christian fantasy author. It just, it's just so <laughs> strange to hear about this. But the reason why I enjoy those so much and enjoy certain of the Marvel movies and, and enjoy others less so is because of that question of meaning that you were just talking about. I want a story that is clearly taking some things seriously, that is taking truth seriously and the themes that you just mentioned as earnestly as possible. And that's why I appreciate it when, like, for example, uh, everyone's talking about uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, not just because of the nostalgic factor. I mean, I grew up on the Tobey Maguire uh, spider films that back when I was in college. I still really enjoy those. And I enjoy the new Spider-Man as well. But 
that story was at its best when the hero, Peter Parker, Peter in the MCU, uh, the, the main one, Tom Holland, uh, is light spoilers here, but his power is taken away. I mean, he, he can still be Spider-Man, but he starts losing a lot. He tried to save all of these villains from other dimensions, and then it turned out some of them don't want to be saved. And Mm -hmm. you get this great nostalgic uh, rush by seeing the the previous uh, Spider-Men from other films uh, coming in to join him because they were also pulled in from other dimensions. But their appearance was not just a a fan service. It was meaningful. You know, they served his story and he served theirs. And at at least for a Spider-Fan, you got plenty of meaning in there, just like you got in a story like Man of Steel where you see this super battle, you know, principal power versus abusive power, and then they're tearing up Metropolis. And you see the consequences of that fight. You see people suffering and dying. And then the entire next film is about what happens on the ground. How do the nations and cultures of the world react to this idea of Superman, you know, an alien God among them and hit or miss in the execution, according to some fans. But I really appreciate just the idea of a story that's going to take those things seriously. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I would say that uh, on the other end of the spectrum with, with some Christian fiction, what, what people have done traditionally is they've gone for the meaning right away without right. earning it through the story. And so I, I sometimes point people to a, a Christmas Carol and I say, you know, Dickens was brilliant in A Christmas Carol because Ebenezer Scrooge doesn't change until every person in the audience already wants him to change. He's, he earns the transformation by convincing us that it's right for Scrooge to repent and become a better person and honor, you know, honor Christmas all the year or whatever. But a, a lot of times with our, we, we want to preach, we want just people to accept the message without, you know, going through the story first, earning, earning the message, whatever mm-hmm. the message is, or the oh, message is the wrong word. The, the meaning, yeah, the meaning of the story. Right. The, me- the meaning is, is the not, good word. Yeah. Not yeah, the moral, yeah. not the message, but mm-hmm. the meaning. Right. Well, I, I like this contrast between films that are about that are primarily about power. It's you know just either the unprincipled or the principled power, versus the films that are. I think you said it's unpowered principle versus unprincipled power. I I really like that contrast because what that kind of story points us to is truth. Whereas you know it, it's really a struggle for what is true, what is good, what is beautiful, what is right, what is ethical. Whereas the the former type of story that's just about two different kinds of power is it leads to this very popular idea nowadays, which is there is no truth but power. Yes. And I, yeah. I think that that, you know, those kind of stories are resonating with our culture, but for very dark reasons. You know, there's a lot of uh, people at the fringes of the political spectrum that are just entirely obsessed with power. And, uh, you know, who has power, who doesn't have power, who should have power. And uh, I just think that this is not the way to go. If your only ambition in life is to get more power, that's not going to work. Like that's yeah. human beings are just not made for that. And that really goes back to the very first lie. You can be like God. You know, yeah. you can have all the power that you want. Uh, oh, whatever God said, that's not true. I, I, God didn't really say that. Don't worry about, you know, the truth. It's just, just get the power of what you want. Honestly, it's just, I look at, I see it in scripture. I mean, you, you mentioned the, f- the first lie. I would, I would also point to the lie, I would say, is a, a lie that Satan says to God about Job when he says, um, ha- does Job fear God for free? Uh. It's it, it, transactional. If the, the first chapters of Job, he's actually saying, it's, it's by implication, you're only God because you're powerful, not because you're good. People aren't, they're not allied to your goodness. They're allied to your power. and the the to me, the meaning of Job, a deeper meaning of Job, is that Job is at, le- is at least proves, in a sense, that his allegiance is to God's goodness, not to God's power. Mm. And that's something that in the scriptures, I think they point to a lot. I also see it in, um, Malcolm Muggeridge has a book called Escape from Christendom, and he talks about interviewing a Russian science fiction writer who defected. Uh, this was back when Muggeridge was um, editor of, or he was a correspondent for Punch magazine, I think. And he asked him, how the church was able to thrive under this incredibly powerful system of the Soviet Union. He said, mm. more power than any other governments ever had over its people, more abusive. The church didn't just, didn't just survive it. It was able to 
like thrive in a way that just blew him away. He said, I would have said this is impossible if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. And the science fiction writer said, well, first of all, um, Stalin thought he couldn't ban the works of Tolstoy. <laughs> so it helped <laughs> to have Tolstoy. Uh, but the biggest thing is the church realized, we realized that um, against that kind of power, an alternate power would never be able to destroy it. We couldn't win coming up with some other arrangement of power versus power. We needed some other type of power. And the only thing strong enough is the love of Christ. So we pitted the love of Christ against the power of the Soviet Union. Mm. Now, to me, that's one of the clearest examples of power versus principle and how it works. And a lot of people died and were tortured under, mm. under the Soviet Union for their faith. And yet something, you know, it doesn't look like power you know, love doesn't right. look like power, <laughs> but it actually is. And that, to me, that's one of the messages that stories tell throughout time across cultures, you know, from generation to generation, stories in a way are telling us, hey guys, there's something more powerful than power, more important than mm. power. Yeah, and it's stuff power. like love mm -hmm. and forgiveness. And yeah, yeah. That harkens back to the words of Gamaliel where he he warned the other uh, Pharisees, he's like, hey, if this is from God, you're not going to be able to stand against it. So yeah. it's better that you just call it now because uh, this thing is just going to eat you alive if it's from God. And, um, you know, I always wonder what happened to Gamaliel because he influenced Paul. So did, did Paul go back to him and say, hey, I found the Messiah? Or was it the other way around? Did Gamaliel already know Jesus and he was kind of planting the seeds in Paul? Side note there. That's a but, cool yeah, question. I, I, yeah, but I, I think it very much uh, goes to this, you know, do we, do we believe where Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world? Right. You know, do we, do we belong to his kingdom ultimately? And what, whatever, whatever it is that, you know, we're going to do in the present day, are we ultimately citizens of that kingdom? And are, do we believe that that kingdom is coming and it has come? Um, so that's, uh, that's cool. And I, I can, I can see a lot of this. I'm sure a lot of this is weaving into a story about an attorney, you know, going through the corporate system, the legal system. And it, and it's very much about, you know, this, this battle over this battle for truth, this battle for righteousness, this, this battle for justice, obviously. Our second sponsor for this episode, once again, be us at the Lorehaven Guild, our exclusive discord hosted community for heroes who want to explore the best Christian made fantasy with monthly book quests. This month of April, we are exploring the Green Ember, S.D. Smith's fantasy, a talking animal story with meaning. We reviewed this book not too long ago and had S.D. Smith on our podcast in February, and now we get to explore the book ourselves throughout the month of April, hosted by Lorehaven writer Elijah David. Just go to lorehaven.com and subscribe to get Lorehaven updates, and we will send you the super secret invite code by which you may portal magically into the guild community. It's an amazing castle in the sky. Many heroes dwell therein. And we're just wrapping up our book quest for Lonnie Forbes is the seventh sun. And we will start the book quest for the green ember on Monday, April the 4th. Before then, we're actually going out live, not an imaginary guild, not a discord server, but Lorehaven will appear at a live event right here in my town, actually just North of Austin, Texas. The Teach Them Diligently Homeschool Conference is hosting an event at the Kalahari Resorts starting Thursday, March 31st and going through Saturday, April 2nd. I will be there. Zach is planning to stop by at our booth when he can, but we also have special guests at the booth. Uh, author James R. Hannibal, lately of Wolf Soldier, as well as the Light Raiders Discipleship Learning Adventure, formerly known as Dragon Raid. He's been on the podcast a few times. We are hosting a booth together now. We're also joined by author Jamie Foley. She wrote uh, Ember Hawk and a bunch of other great fantasy novels. She also does marketing for Enclave Publishing, and she will join us to share some of their books as well as her own through Fayette Press. Enclave is the publisher of Maxine Justice, Galactic Attorney, and many others. So you can stop by the booth, meet her, get those books, uh, look at Light Raiders, and of course, see some stuff from Lorehaven, including print copies of our magazine, and copies of my book, The Pop Culture Parent. That is March 31st through April 2nd at Teach Them Diligently at Kalahari Resorts in Round Rock, Texas. All links in the show notes, as well as links to the Lorehaven Guild for further information, or go to lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors. Where do you see this going in the future? Like either with this story or with 
with other kind of stories? Like, what do you hope this inspires within Christian science fiction? Well, uh, again, like I, I don't want to even think that, you know, my work's going to inspire other people to, <laughs> I mean, if it does, that's really <laughs> cool. But, but I, I've lowered my expectations. The older you get, I think the more you realize <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, not not that I'm insignificant because I I I am loved by God and and every believer mm-hmm. you know by virtue of being adopted into his family we have this amazing significance and yet I don't think I'm qualified to look at my own significance and even evaluate it. I have no idea what <laughs> what influence my work might have. Um but I if it could help people to see that you don't have to preach that actually your if your story is your message it will actually go farther and it will make more of an impact and it's not that you approach it with a blank worldview it's not that at all it's it, if you're if you're convinced as a disciple of Jesus that you are following the way and the truth and the life it doesn't necessarily mean that you are the standard of the way and the truth and the life but it means there is one this is one of the things i said might be a little controversial but I don't like a lot of modern secular science fiction now because it's so preachy. I thought Christian yeah. science fiction would become more subtle than it was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And instead, secular science fiction has become more preachy. Yeah. <laughs> it's the other way around. It's now an we odd have odd reversal. Yeah. It's an odd reversal. Instead of the instead of both sides going, you know, we should be more artistic with this. Yeah. We should actually <laughs> try to get back to basic principles. Both sides have said, no, we want to beat people over the head with our message. Both sides is, t- I'm drawing two, not everybody's doing it, but y- you just see it in both camps. Well, Zach incidentally explained this earlier when he was talking about this struggle over power and people deciding that the only thing we should be obsessed about in social political struggles, to be sure, is who's got the most power. I actually heard yeah. someone commenting on a current event recently where he was asked to define a basic understanding of human nature. And this person literally, and this is as close a paraphrase as I can recall, said, I don't get into definitions like that. I'm only interested in the politics. And I thought that is wow. inhuman. That is absolutely inhuman because now and if you understand the word politics simply to mean issues of public policy, okay, I can understand that. But to say it's only about the politics in that way means I'm only interested in who has the power. That is yeah. how it comes across. Right. That is all that you're left with without these basic definitions of human concepts and the Christian approaches this from the perspective of God, the creator gives the definitions. He gives the instructions. He defines love. He defines power for he himself is love and power. There's no way around that without him. You're looking to government for power or as in Maxine justice, you have corporations that are full of this kind of power. And very truly in the opening chapters of this book, you, you have an example of a flawed person who is entrapped in the legal system. It's the person whom Maxine is defending, uh, who may not be the greatest defendant in the world, but clearly uh, is being used by this corporation uh, that is uh, rigging the legal system. And, you know, people may make those uh, accusations without justification, but it does happen. Uh, And even when you're talking, we were talking earlier about some of the issues with superhero movies and stuff. Uh, the Walt Disney Company has been in the in the news lately for literally these exact reasons. Uh, the CEO apparently is of a mind to say, hey, guys, we're just going to put great stories out there and there's power in the stories and that's what we're going to do. And a bunch of the activists said, no, you must go political. It's not enough to be subtle with the stories. Like, he was throwing them a bone. He was saying, guys, uh, yeah. we're going to yep. influence people subtly through the entertainment that we offer to families across the world. And they said, no, you need to give to this cause. You need to release a statement. You need to get overt about it. Meanwhile, some Christians are still lost in that, but others are going, hey, let's let's be more subtle. Uh, let's explore these themes as fans and the stories we like, you know, not so much beating people over the head. And then the, the secular storytellers are, if they're not beating people over the head, they've got members of the new religious high priestly class telling them. You've got to beat people over the head or else we're going to have you canceled. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's sad because it, to me, it shows a, a lack of understanding of the real power of storytelling and where it comes mm-hmm. from. And I, th- I think that the church should be leading the way in this. You know, we have by virtue of, if, if nothing else, and I don't mean this as, as a little thing, 
the Holy Spirit as a teacher. We ought to be the ones who are stepping out with confidence through the imagination that is controlled, not just, hey, whatever you want is, you know, it's fair game. Uh, this is this is relevant to what we've been saying, but Zechariah 4, there's this statement in there that doesn't seem to be explained anywhere else. And uh, it's something that that people will have heard in churches many times, but uh, what Zechariah is told is, it's not by might, nor by power, but by mm. my spirit. And if the church actually started to take that seriously, that even in our storytelling, it's not by might and it's not by power, it's by my spirit. It, it's, or even translating that to a simple, it's, it's by principle. It's mm. by telling the truth about things and, and not making it worse than it is and not making it better than it is, just telling the truth about the world that we live in. Man, what a breath of fresh air that would be for our stories. Yeah, I mean I mean absolutely a breath of fresh air because you know this this preachiness that comes across in secular fiction it's making everyone walk on eggshells. Yeah. Because you have to get everything right. You, you as an author can't mess up. You can't have characters who mess up or or do do something problematic or offensive or or whatever. And the the Christian worldview is look, we're all messed up. We're all problematic. <laughs> You know, we're all offensive to someone. We're offensive to God, most of all. And, but God is patient with us. He's gracious. And he's yeah, if merciful. Maxine can't mess up, she's in trouble and I'm in trouble. Right. <laughs> right. So like, you know, what, what kind of a stories, well, I just keep wondering, you know, these endless purity tests that are going on in our culture, how, how are we ever going to have a heroic journey uh, of someone who goes through a significant internal change? Yeah. You know, because that's so much more interesting rather than just a story of someone who's always right and who never messes up and always does the right thing. And that's just, you know, that's just very boring. I love these stories like uh, Despicable Me, you know, yeah. about, about Gru, this villain who becomes a hero, or even going back to uh, the 90s a little bit, this Jack Nicholson film, As Good As It Gets. Just an odd reference in my head right now, but this, uh, uh, <laughs> this really curmudgeonly guy that's OCD and, uh, you know, just he's an, I think he's an author too. And, um, you know, he's just this horrible person at the beginning, but he's, he's kind of funny, but by the end he becomes a lot more, uh, compassionate towards others. He becomes a little smoother around the edges. And those are the interesting stories, you know, of internal change, but you have to show people being problematic, being offensive. And, um, you know, the, the Christian worldview is, you know, we, this is our home territory. You know, our entire faith is built around people that completely screwed things up, and yet yeah. God brought them out of that, brought them through an internal change, and by doing so, demonstrates God's God's goodness. You know, hey, the story is about God being righteous and being amazing and beautiful, and so our our story should absolutely point to that. Yeah, Amen. So, Daniel, what other characters and worlds might summon you next, and how can fans follow your stories and your other work? Well, uh, right now I'm working on a dissertation for my for my schooling. Basically, I'm in I'm in school again, uh, so it may be a little while before I'm able to produce another novel. I'm hoping at the end of the year I can start working on another Maxine Justice novel. But um, right now it's turning. Uh, ideas for me have to kind of percolate for something like two to three years. Uh, for me to really um, dive in and, and know what I'm doing with them. That's not true for lots of writers, but it is for me. Um, so I, I can't really say what I'm going to do next. If it's not Maxine Justice, I don't know what the idea is yet. So where can fans follow your stories and your other work? My website's probably the best place, just danschwabauer.com. All right, and we will include those links in the show notes. Daniel, it's been great to have you. I look forward to seeing uh, what stories percolate in your mind next and uh, how you will pursue the principles of Jesus Christ, not just the power that comes through worldly approaches to stories. So Godspeed to you, sir. Hey, thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. Stephen, that was great having Daniel Schwabauer on our podcast. I didn't think I would, I would be interested in a story about lawyers, uh, but that is such a fun twist on a sci-fi alien invasion to, uh, to have it focus on that. But you know, it, it makes me think back to something. Uh, well, first of all, at the beginning of the show, you, you, you said, you know, insert your lawyer joke here. My uncle Joe is a lawyer. 
And so he taught me every lawyer joke there is all growing up. And so it, it's just funny. Those have always been in the back of my head. But a couple of months ago, I found this YouTube channel, Rakita Law, and they did this uh, panel uh, of lawyers and they were talking about the, the big, hot court case, which we won't, won't go into, but it was a very high profile court case. And all of them were you know, giving their analysis of it. They're analyzing the, the defense, the prosecution. They were kind of picking apart the arguments. They were looking at the law. And they were having a really good, friendly debate about it. And it really hit me when I was watching that, like, I miss this sort of thing. You know, th- this reminds me of the kind of the apologetics uh, debates I used to get into in college on forums or just uh, in person. You know, it's really refreshing to be around people that really want to get at the truth of something, really want to get at the kind of the accuracy of a, of a statement or a belief or a event and you know, I learned so much listening to them, but it really just kind of refreshed me. And it's like, yeah, you know, Western civilization is very much built on this. It's very much built on the law and, you know, the, um, what is it? Lex Rex, like the law is king and, and not just, you know, Rex Lex, like the, the king makes the law. Or, you know, in, in other words, we are, we are a society of rule by law and not just rule by man. And so that, um, I, I think this book is, is going to be fantastic. Well, let's go to the comm station and hear from our fantastic fans. Um, we got a note from Brave Sir Robin. Brave Sir Robin, he bravely <laughs> ran away, away. <laughs> Just an excellent username. So uh, he commented on episode 103, and this was about uh, when, when Christians clash. And Brave Sir Robin says, quote, the challenge is not only to present Steelman arguments to oppose the protagonist, but also to portray this protagonist as an earthen vessel. I have a particular fondness for unreliable first-person narrators like Huckleberry Finn, Nick Carraway from The Great Gatsby, and Alfred, the narrator of A Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, which I am currently reading because the enemy of my enemy may serve as ally for a time. End quote. I've actually seen a lot of discussion in the Lorehaven Guild about A Handmaid's Tale. I haven't been able to participate myself, uh, not just because I haven't read it, but it is interesting to see uh, some uh, compliments for this book, uh, which has been used, name-checked often, even some cosplay in uh, political debates. But apparently, apart from the show, the book itself uh, has a little bit more of a nuanced presentation of religion, as I understand, at least from casually glancing at those comments. So... Actually, I just realized that I've accidentally tried to follow the example that Brave Sir Robin was just talking about. Steel man in the opposition. You don't turn him into a cartoon character that's easily to mock and spoof and pull down and critique uh, just because their ideas are so stupid. You actually view them as a human being whom God has made who is complex and may have beliefs that you don't understand, but you need to understand in order to not only debate them, but in order to show that person the love of Christ. So I really appreciate his comment there. And I appreciated that discussion back in episode 103. It's uh, definitely one of my favorite episodes. Another hero at the Lorehaven Guild replied to episode 104, our most recent episode about Pilgrim's Progress with Zachary Bartles, the uh, podcaster who's adapting that for a long-form serial podcast. This commentator said, This episode rocked, you guys. You could have kept talking for another hour and I would have stayed glued to my headset. From John Bunyan to Veggie Tales and back again. Great stuff. I'll be checking out the podcast and more about your guest. End quote. That's great. I uh, really appreciated talking with Zachary Bartles. And since then, I've been listening to more of the Pilgrim's Progress podcast from High and Silver. We'll have that link in the show notes as well. Uh, it's great to kind of rediscover Christian allegory and get past the simplistic notion that allegory is always inferior or it's always too easy. You just get the good guys and the bad guys and you learn your Sunday school lesson and then your life is changed. Well, sometimes actually allegory can reflect the nuances and complexities of our christian life you don't always know exactly who's going to make it to the celestial city while you're on the road you'll only know when you get there and i think that that truth is latent in pilgrim's progress along with a lot of other subtler presentations of humanity along with some over-the-top stuff uh, like pointing to the sheep and saying these are god's sheep and like thanks thanks uh, know that you know allegory can be <laughs> kind of weird especially when you're a puritan preacher <laughs> In the 1600s, as John Bunyan was. Now, it just hit me. Is there a Veggie Tales version of the Pilgrim's Progress? Don't know, but there should. Well, there should have been. I don't know yeah. if I'd want them to do it now. Mm, uh, it yeah, may have been, uh, maybe too much of it. But now they, of course, did a Lord of the Rings version, which 
I know everybody likes, but I did not like it. I think no. they hijacked Lord of the Rings and turned it into some kind of social justice thing. By the end, I was not a fan. Mm. But then again, I, you know, I like parody, uh, but I also yeah. like it when we take things seriously. I, I kind of want to take Lord of the Rings seriously while also sharing the stupid memes. So anyway, don't share stupid memes. Uh, share thoughtful thoughts about this episode and others by emailing podcast at lorehaven.com. What do you think about aliens taking over the earth, not by means of death rays, but by means of corporate espionage? Find us and tag us on the socials. Just look for Lorehaven on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And of course, join the Lorehaven Guild by subscribing to Lorehaven. Most importantly, lorehaven.com. Find the subscribe box, enter your email, get the super secret access code to the Lorehaven Guild. Next on Fantastical Truth, like we mentioned earlier, Lorehaven is going live at the Teach Them Diligently Homeschool Conference in Round Rock, Texas from March 31st through April 2nd. I did not mention earlier, though, that the venue for this event was actually literally struck by a tornado this past Monday as we released this episode. Uh, in fact, that tornado hit the building but didn't damage the building. Uh, it was a whirlwind. You can actually see, just Google Round Rock Tornado, you can probably see the video of this storm approaching the Kalahari Resorts. The resort is fine, so the event will proceed as planned, but I did drive over there after the storm passed and saw an RV flipped over, lots of cars with glass blown out, and signs and trees overturned. But the building's okay, so we will still appear at the Teach Them Diligently conference with James R. Hannibal and Jamie Foley. Look for the Lorehaven booth. And I wouldn't be surprised if we here on this podcast got to talk with them about the event, along with any passers-by families who don't mind sharing why they love fantastical Christian-made stories and games and beyond. Meanwhile, maybe you don't need to watch out for lawyers, but definitely watch out for aliens. Audiences may love aliens, but if they show up, they probably don't have the greatest of intentions. And make sure that you are appreciating stories for the subtler truths and meanings that they convey. You don't need to fall for a story that beats you over the head any more than you would need to fall for a company that abuses you in a court of law. It is God who is our judge, and he has given us the gift of stories to enjoy for his glory. That's what we intend to keep doing at Lorehaven as we continue to seek and find his fantastical truth. 